My name is Aina Kori. I come from Denmark. Um, I have a PhD in computer science. What I'm doing is that I am, uh, I'm, I'm an independent consultant in my company called Meta Developer. And it's called Meta Developer because I'm not a developer anymore, but I'm developing developers. So I'm creating IT conferences for developers. I'm facilitating meetings for developers. I'm an agile coach for developers. And I'm teaching the teachers how to teach computer science at university. And right now, I'm actually trying to teach somebody to teach the teachers how to teach computer science at university. So that's why I'm called Meta Developer. And I'm here to tell you today about all the things about agile development that your mother never told you. And I've got three kids, and the oldest is studying computer science and is hearing a lot from me about agile development. And the second child is a tester at a software company and also hearing a lot from his mother about agile development. The youngest is completely uninterested in hearing about it, and that's why I have to talk to you today. So welcome to this talk. So once upon a time in Denmark, in 2001 to be more precise, I just finished my uh, PhD in computer science, which was based on design patterns and programming languages, very far away from agile and processes. And the first thing I did after I left the university was to teach rational unified process. And I don't know if any of you remember the rational unified process, but it was not agile. It was very much not agile. At the same time, I was working at a small company in Denmark, uh, at that time a small company in Denmark, and uh, we were only doing agile development. So my first job as a developer, I worked with extreme programming. Uh, Ken Beck was a friend of the house, and we designed pair programming tables together uh, so that we could have pair programming tables in all our, in all our classrooms, as we called it. So when I, when I when I created this talk, I, I wrote an email to Kent Beck and I asked him, so, Kent, is it true that with XP, you didn't really think about it a lot? It was just something that popped out of, of the things that worked when you did software development. And I think it took about five minutes for him to answer. He said, I know it wasn't that we didn't think. Okay, that came out wrong, sorry about that. Uh, it, we were actually following the, uh, the first values and principles about agile development, about good development. And you remember the, uh, the year 2001 was also the year of the Agile Manifesto. So it was, it was about that time when people started writing it down and, and giving it to everybody. And as you know, a lot of things have happened since then. There's been a lot of myths about agile development. There's been a lot of misunderstandings about agile development. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. So this is going to be slightly depressing. So if, some of, if any of you came here to laugh, I'm sorry, I have extra tissues in my bag. Um, I'm going to talk about what happened since the Agile Manifesto. Where are we today? Is it even feasible to say that we're doing Agile software development? Are we doing it when we're saying we're doing it? Or are we doing it when we're not saying we're doing it? There's been a lot of... Um, people who has tried to make new methodologies about Agile development. Uh, my friend Craig Smith has created a talk called 40 Agile Minutes in 40 Minutes, where he's going through 40 different Agile methodologies in 40 minutes. It's, it's, a, it's a very rushed talk, and it shows you how many times people have tried to write this down in a way so that other people could just take it and use it. You remember the Spotify method? A lot of people used the Spotify method, then people said, Spotify is not using the Spotify method anymore because we've moved along. And I think that's the gist of it. That's what I want to say. I want us to go back to the principles and the values. I want us to think that Agile is about inspecting and adapting, not about doing specific meetings, except for the retrospectives, of course. I think you should do those. But apart from that, you can do whatever you want. So it was, it was really nice for me to sort of grow up in a place that worked with Agile and worked with Kent Beck even though it was a bit weird to still be teaching waterfall methodologies and processes to people, but that's, th that's something from a different story. But what I saw over the years is that this wonderful, flexible, 
fun way of developing software suddenly got a very bad repetition. There was people at conferences, agile conferences, we wanted to invite more technical people to the agile conferences. But the technical people said, I don't want to talk on an agile conference because I find it such a waste of time. I'm like, hmm, I think we have a problem here. With these agile conferences, we want more technically minded people, but they don't want to speak at these conferences because they think it's embarrassing. It's going to root their street cred. So something's obviously wrong. What, what is it that is wrong? Why is it that um, people like Alan Hollop have to say, Agile is dead, long live agility? I mean, I, I completely agree with everything that he's saying, but it seems a bit sad to say that Agile is dead because it started off as such a good way of thinking about it. I also have a good, win, uh, a good friend who is, uh, who's, a, who's a leader and, and still a developer in a, in a big company, and when I talk to him about Agile, he says, I hate Agile. Whenever people are mentioning Agile, he's like, ugh, don't want to talk to you anymore. Don't want to work Agile. Okay, I say, that's interesting because your developers, they talk together every morning, right? Yes, of course they do. It would be stupid otherwise if they don't like check up on each other. Right. And, and the people who are using your software, you, you talk to them in recurring intervals, right? Yes, of course we do. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to figure out if we're doing the right thing or not. Right, okay. Hmm. And your developers, they're not following a set process. They're sort of figuring out how do we need to meet, how do we need to communicate, how do we need to, do we need to make more pair programming than, than code reviews, or do we need to make more code reviews than pair programming? Do we need to do some ensemble or mob programming? Yes, of course they do. Of course they're thinking about that. And then I said, but then you are doing agile development. But he's saying, no, I'm not doing agile development. And this is a stupid discussion. And that's what I think is so sad that some people who are really doing the right thing and who is doing exactly what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about agile development, hates agile development. And I don't know if any of you have experienced this, but I think that part of it is because when people are really good at developing software in the right way, they're not really thinking about how they do it anymore. And that leads us back to what is it that happens to people when they become experts? So I'm going to uh, borrow from the, the Brothers Dreyfus, the model of skill acquisition. Some of you might know it already. I love this. I, I find a way to put this into all my talks, no matter what I'm talking about. But the, this skill acquisition, you start off with being a novice. You use the context-free rules. Maybe uh, you came right out of business school and you took a, a Scrum certification, and you know exactly how to follow these rules, right? Then you hear from other people, you're talking to other people, maybe at meetups, um, maybe just at your workplace, and then you become what they call a beginner. You can start to apply guidelines. Okay, right. So it might be that we don't have a stand-up meeting every morning, but that's okay because in this situation it's impossible. It's still agile, right? Then maybe we start applying it a little bit more, uh, we learn from that, and then we become competent. So we know now that we can respond to the unexpected. So we're not just following the rules and the guidelines anymore, we can actually think when we're in the situation. Then we start discussing our experiences. This is what we're doing at conferences like this. When we're meeting, I hope that in the breaks, you'll talk to some other people, you'll discuss your experiences, you'll discuss what you got out of these presentations, and you'll learn from each other, because then you'll become proficient. And when you are proficient, you can unconsciously combine all these different things and solve a lot of situations that you couldn't, couldn't do before. And when you have lots and lots and lots of practice, then you become an expert. And an expert, that's what we all want to be, right? It's, it's wonderful. Oh, the chicken section. Okay, that's, if, if there are no questions at the end, you can ask me about the chicken section. Uh, so, when you are an expert, you have an intuitive grasp of the whole situation. And that's what we all want. But the problem with being an expert is that you're not thinking about what you're doing anymore. You're not considering what it is you're doing. You're doing something which might be agile, but you don't think it's agile. It's just common sense. But of course, as you know, common sense is not nearly as common as you'd hope it would be. But the thing about being an expert is that once you are an expert, you can get stuck in being an expert. 
and you don't learn anymore. So if you are an expert, I feel sad for you, but what you can do is that you can start teaching. Because when you start teaching, you need to, oops, you need to try to talk to people on other levels of skill acquisition. Because if you're teaching somebody who's only a beginner, you have to understand what they understand so that you can move them to the next level. If you're teaching somebody who's competent or a novice, you need to talk about things in different ways. So it's quite important when you have become an expert to start teaching, because that will make you more conscious about what it is you're an expert in. But of course, my good friend here just still hates agile development. But if I should go back to what I think is the gist of agile development, it is the feedback cycles. And I borrowed some feedback cycles from the principles here. The first one, our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. So it seems obvious, but one anecdote, I, I went to a, uh, a big university in Denmark, and I was helping the IT department become more agile. And uh, as always, when I'm called out to make people become more agile, it's actually, they've got other problems. It, they don't really need to be more agile. They need to fix a lot of the other problems. But let, let's get back to that later. But one of the problems they had here was that they never talked to their customers, because the customers were in-house customers. They were doing the IT for the university, and their customers were the other people employed in the other departments of the university. And they hated each other. All the other people who were using the software from the IT department hated the IT department. They thought they were really, um, they were really, uh, what's it called, arrogant, and uh, they didn't want to listen to them, and they never did what they wanted them to do, and they created very bad IT. And the IT department on the other side thought that all these users were completely stupid. They didn't understand anything of the brilliant software they'd done, and they were not able to explain exactly what they wanted in the software. So they had these fences. And one of the things that I introduced there was that when you should actually have review sessions with the customers. And I know that for everybody here, that's not a surprise. I know that everybody here has review sessions with the actual users of the systems, right? Yeah, you do. Of course you do. Um, but we, we did that. And it was amazing. Um, I bought a lot of cake for the first meeting because there was a lot of hate. And if people eat sugar, it, it sort of makes them a little bit happier. And if they eat sugar together with other people, they think they like the other people. So it's a psychological trick that really works well. It's, it's not that I'm calling people monkeys, but <laughs> they are, really. Um, and, and one of the beautiful things that happened is that the first meeting, they were really like to each other. But then I tried to make the IT people explain to the users what they'd actually been doing. So here's an example. Users. Right, so we just said we wanted the data to go from this system to this system. How can that be difficult? If I look in this system, I see 33. If I look in this system, I see 36. Why can't we have the same data in this system? And the people in the IT, normally they would just be offended by something like that. But I, but I had sort of prepared them. I said, let's, let's draw some pictures and show them how many roads these data have to go through in order to get over to your system, and how many things that can delay these things and change these things. And they actually made the people who were using the system understand how difficult it was. And so they had more empathy for the poor IT people. Now, another thing happened that I thought was quite fun, and this was also very typical for what would happen. There was some, when a student updated something in this part of the system, we needed that update in the department for the grading system. And at the moment, it took a day to get the data from here to there. And of course, the users of the system said, that's not good enough, because we need to be able to grade the, the students. We can't wait a day. IT departments say, how long do you want to wait? People who are using the system are saying, we would like it immediately. Can you do that? What did the IT people apply? Of course we can do that immediately. 
And I said, okay, wait, this sounds like a very good solution, but let's talk a little bit about how long it will take you to create the system that has this immediately. IT development mulling around. It will delay the system three weeks. All the users, <gasps> really? Yeah, I said, that's what happens when you say you want it immediately. They will say yes, they can do it, but it will delay them. They had no idea about that. So we tried to figure out how much time can we delay it, like with the trade-off of how long does it take to change this system. And they found a way to, to meet in the middle. But they needed a mediator to talk. So I think that this um, principle of, of talking to, uh, to the customers and having a continuous delivery of the running software is not as easy as it sounds. It's actually a little bit more difficult. They need a mediator. So you can't just put these people together in the same room and they'll love each other, especially not if they've hated each other for a long time. Now we have this also, business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. It also sounds really easy, right? I mean, especially before COVID, everybody could just sit in the same room. But it's not as easy as it sounds because the business people have different meetings than the development people. And uh, they've, they're all very busy with their own things, and they don't speak the same language again. That's one of the bigger problems. You can't just put people together and expect them to communicate if they can't. So one of the things I did in one of the companies I worked with was that I introduced ensemble programming, which used to be called mob programming. I try to introduce ensemble programming everywhere I am. Most places, they don't want it. So, Mob programming or ensemble programming is that everybody in the room is working on the same software at the same time. They're using the same keyboard, or maybe they use their own keyboard, but they're using their own, the same computer and the same screen, and they're working on the same problem. They're all helping each other. Business people, data people, architects, developers. Normally what people say is that it's a complete waste of time. The developers are the only ones who should touch the keyboard. Everybody else should stay away and just communicate every day. But in the two places, and it is only two, where I've actually managed to make people try this out. And when I say try this out, I mean try it out for real. There was once where I said it to them and the project manager said, great, we'll do it tomorrow. And it's like, ooh, this sounds promising. And then she showed up with a, with a huge bug report with 117 bugs that she thought we could fix on this mock programming day. It's not the best way to start this ensemble programming. Try developing new features or something like that. But in the two places that actually tried it, they were both very happy, and one of them actually created an ensemble programming part of the office so that the different teams can say, today we're doing ensemble programming. And there is actually sort of a little bit of a war between the people. They really all want to do this because they can see how you, how you can work a lot faster together when you don't have to wait for the answers. The last thing I want to talk about is this. At regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, then tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. Obviously, retrospectives. I love retrospectives. I've, even, I've written a book about all the mistakes I've made facilitating retrospectives. And uh, I think retrospectives is, is really, really important. Um, I, I think they're important because even, even if you talk together every day, it's still worthwhile to take some time to reflect together to share, to appreciate what happened, and to try to learn, to try to improve the way that you're working together. I had a retrospective with a group of leaders yesterday, and they'd never had a retrospective before, because people think that retrospectives is, for, is only for scrum teams, for developers. But actually, leaders need retrospectives as well. And, and it was a really, um, it, was, it was a very, it was one of the more eventful retrospectives where I really had to remember that I can't say anything about what happened. But uh, it was really interesting. And I just want to say about retrospectives that even if you think you talk to people, it's still good. So when I started doing retrospectives with my family, with my husband and my children, they of course hated it because they're teenagers and they hate everything that I do. But uh, it, it's really valuable, even if I think I'd speak to my family every day, just taking time to reflect on the last year, on the vacation, what worked for you, what didn't work for you, what happened, is really, really good. And I think this whole thing about inspecting and adapting the feedback cycles is so important for agile development. When I come out to people and I talk about these things, they say, oh, but we do have feedback cycles. But often, it's only the first half of the feedback cycle 
we do tell people about this. We do tell people about this. We do hear about yes, yes, but what's the what's the cycle? What's coming back? What about the reaction to these things? So sometimes I can be very sad when I'm working with the with agile development in in software companies because people have such high expectations about it unless they hate it if they don't hate it they have really high expectations about it they are thinking that when i'm out there as an agile coach i will solve all their problems but it's actually that's not how it works right when i introduce agile development when i introduce the feedback cycles when i introduce transparency what they see is all the things that are not going well and they can't be solved with scrum or kanban necessarily but now they can see the problems uh, Daniel North um, said this to me once, that sometimes introducing Agile to an organization is like being in a completely dark room and then turning on the light switch, and then there's a big, vicious tiger standing next to you. And everybody's like, you idiot, you turned on the light, now I can see the tiger. But like the tiger was there all the time, you just couldn't see it. And that's one of the things that I see. And also another thing that happens when, when I come out as an Agile coach is that everybody wants me to tell them how good they are at Agile development compared to other people. And I, I, it's a bit like when you go to bed with somebody from the first time, right? They're very, very eager to know how they're performing um, compared to other people, but they only want one answer, right? And it, it's a bit the same when you're an Agile coach. You have to think about this, that even if they are asking, they might not want the real answer. <clears throat> But the, the agility in software development will, will show them um, what they need to do. One of the things that people don't like about Agile is they say that they're wasting a lot of time in meetings. They're wasting a lot of time. Uh, and when, when people are sort of, sometimes I say, okay, well, let's, let's drop the meetings. When they're allowed to drop the meetings, what happens is that they drop things on the floor. It could be that they're wasting five minutes here and 20 minutes here in a meeting, but down the road, they're wasting so much more time if they're not talking about the dependencies, if they're not discussing the estimation. I mean, this is not a no estimation talk. I don't believe that we can estimate as people, at least not complex things, maybe complicated things, but we cannot estimate complex things. But spending time on discussing the estimation is extremely valuable. Because if people think this takes a long time and other people think it takes a short time, that discussion is valuable. That is starting to, to actually solve the problem already there. So you start solving the problem already when you're discussing these things. So it's quite important. But, but is it really possible to have agile development in the companies we have today? Or is it only some companies that can have it? There were some people who said once that, well, maybe we should have a manifesto for the half-assed agile software development. That is, while the items on the left sound nice in theory, we're an enterprise company and there's no way we're letting go on the items on the right. So maybe with individuals and interactions over processes and tools, we should have and we have mandatory processes and tools to control how those individuals, we prefer the term resources, interact. Because I come out and I introduce this Agile, and they really want Agile, they've sent people on a Scrum Master course, but they want time registration. For each story, how many hours would it take? How many hours have you spent? So that they're sure that people are actually doing something. And the project managers are asking the Scrum Masters, how many hours have you spent? And if they've spent a lot of hours, that's a good thing, because that means that they're doing a lot. Don't want to talk about Twitter here, but sometimes measuring things in the wrong way can cause problems. And also customer collaboration over contract negotiation within the boundaries of strict contracts, of course, and subject to rigorous change control. Oh, I love Jessica's here. Now I can make jokes that everybody's laughing at. So um, all these things leads me to this Agile Fluency by Diana Larson and James Shaw. And I don't know how many of you have seen this Agile Fluency before. One and a half. Great. So uh, Diana Larson is the one who wrote um, the book Agile Retrospectives together with Esther Darby. She has been working with Agile, con uh, Agile development for, for a number of years, and, and James Shaw has, has done the same. And what they've done is that they've looked at a lot of companies 
and they've tried to see what kind of fluency they have in Agile. So when they talk about Agile fluency, what they say is that it's a little bit like when you're fluent in the language, right? So I can speak German, but if I hurt myself, I won't swear in German because I'm not fluent in German. I have to think about it. If I'm tired, I don't speak German anymore. If I'm angry, I don't shout in German. And it's a bit like agile fluency, that you can be agile, you can work agile, but if a stakeholder is putting pressure on you, you go back to waterfall. You can be agile, but if somebody uh, is getting fired or the team is getting disrupted, you go back to what you know already. So the agile fluency is what, what fluency level is the organization in? And the first level that the organization can be in is this uh, focusing. 45% of organizations that say they're agile are on the focusing step. And, and what you do is that you have a team culture shift, you introduce Kanban, maybe you introduce Scrum, you introduce Spotify, or maybe you introduce the non-technical parts of uh, XP, like pair programming. And, and this will help you focus on building value, this will help you focus on, on doing the right thing. Now, 35% will go into delivering, and this means that the team skills are shifting. Now you can not just do the right thing, but you can do the thing right. You actually have um, running software that you can deliver again and again. You have continuous integration. Uh, you are more fluent in Agile. It takes a little bit more to rock the boat and you will be following a lot more of the principles. Now, the next stage is optimizing. This takes an organizational culture shift, and only 5% of the organization actually ends in this level. This is where the whole organization is optimizing for creating the right value to the right customers in the right way. This is where you're working together as an organization you're not trying to step over each other's toes by siloing with OKRs or siloing with uh, burn-down charts and not wanting to help each other. This is where the whole organization works together. And then the last stage, less than 1%, is called the strengthening phase. And Daniel Larsen and uh, James Shaw says that maybe this is the future of Agile. This is something about beyond budgeting. This is something about uh, systems thinking, systems theory. This is about creating a whole organization that is always thinking about all the people, the focus on the value, the focus on what you're doing. And the interesting thing about this is that you need to be realistic about what level of fluency you want. Because it's very often that I join an organization and their dream scenario is that they want to be in the optimizing stage. Because what they say on the CXO level is that they want to compete with other people. They want to be first on the market. They want to have the best quality of software. They want to have people who never quit because they love being there. And the thing that they are willing to invest in is 10 people on the Scrum Master course. <laughs> and that doesn't change things. And why doesn't it change things? Several reasons. One reason is, if you have a software system that you cannot understand, then it is very, very difficult to change a little part of that software system. If we go back to the principle about inspecting and adapting, if we want to always think about, are we doing the right thing in the right way, then we need to be able to change these things. And if we don't understand the system, and we're worried that it's going to look like this, then we can't adapt. And the feedback cycle only goes one way. We hear, OK, the users would like this, but we can't perform it. So what I've been thinking about, and other people have been thinking about as well, is should we actually talk about technical agile fluency? It's a bit like the tech part of the XP, where we're also doing um, refactoring, and, and we're also looking at continuous integration. So what I do when I'm in a company now is that instead of just thinking about the agile fluency, I'm thinking about what, what is actually, what's the support for this? How safe do people feel? Because they need to be safe in order to adapt. And, and you might wonder, <coughs> do I ever see somebody who don't have version control? 
what I do. And then <clears throat> test before the user test, is it? Do I even see places where they don't do that? Yes, I do. Automated test suite. I'm, I can understand why people don't always have this, because it is quite an investment. But, I mean, you can't really be agile unless you have an automated test suite. Because if you don't have that, then people are worried about making changes. And if they're worried about making changes, they won't make the best solutions. And then the last thing is continuous integration. Integrate always. Like integrate, whenever you commit something, it's tested and integrated. You don't have these branches that live for months on end, and people become more and more scared of merging these branches with, with the core of the, of the development. We see that as well, right? And when people have these branches, and it becomes more and more difficult to merge it, then they can't be agile. And then the developers are being told, you have to be agile, you have to be agile. And they're like, I'm trying, but I can't. And they're like, you must be stupid, go on another Scrum course. But that's not going to change anything, unless you have that support. So I just want you to think about, while I take a sip of the water, is Agile actually possible where you are right now? And then this slide, you don't have to do this, because I know you're British and you hate to talk to strangers. <laughs> so I only put this slide in for you to be relieved. You don't have to do this. Doesn't it feel nice? Yeah, I thought it would. That's the only reason I had that one. But I'm sort, of, I'm sort of wrapping up here because there might be questions or maybe you just want to get lunch early. But what I want you to think about when you think about agile fluency, when people say we want to be so agile, think about what do they actually want to invest in when it comes to the people and what do they want to invest in when it comes to the technical support for Agile. Because if they don't want to invest, it will never be Agile. And people will just be more and more frustrated and Agile coaches will have a very bad rep because we've just been wasting money and nothing has changed. And when we leave, people are just happy to see the back of us. Oh, it's getting really depressing now. Okay, so I just want to talk about one thing at the end. So I talked a little bit about continuous integration and I want to talk about continuous integration and continuous delivery and continuous deployment because people are talking about it in various ways. And continuous integration, I think, is for everybody, where we integrate all the time, continuously, every commit. That should be something that everybody should be able to do. I know that if you have a, if you have a big system, it might be difficult to get started on this, but I'm sure that somebody at this conference can help you with how to get started about this. Now, continuous delivery is where it's ready to go. It's like already packed, and you can send it on to the customers whenever you want to do that. And if you strive to have continuous delivery, if you strive to have like just one button and then it's, it's ready for shipping, then you will get continuous integration. So if you focus on this, you'll get the other. So that would actually be really practical. You might not make it here, but at least you'll have the continuous integration. Then you have the continuous deployment which is not always possible, and it's not always appropriate. Right? Uh, sometimes it's nice for people to have things changed automatically, like the Chrome browser, that doesn't really matter, that it changes automatically. But if you have a car which software changes without you accepting it, you might get a bit scared that the buttons are all over the place. So I think that if you, if you think about these things, you can actually become happy again. You can be happy about Agile development. You can believe in it again. And I try to believe in it at least for, for times. And, and one thing that I really get out of introducing Agile methodologies at companies is that they understand what it is they're doing wrong. Right? We're sort of lowering the water levels, and we can see all the rocks that's at the bottom. And we can remove those rocks so that there's a better flow in the system. So to me, it's just a way of showing the problems. And th so this, these are in the slides by the book, uh, Cheaper. My takeaway message is that I wanted to tell you my story about Agile development from the start and what I have experienced as an Agile coach. The promise of Agile has been lost for some people, but it's still there, and it can still provide you with something valuable. And the misconceptions of Agile, which I think is very sad that people misunderstand it, either they hate it 
or they believe that it can change everything. And then what now? What's the future of Agile? Is it the Agile fluency uh, last, um, last part, last level? Um, is it beyond budgeting? Is it that we should all have lean startups everywhere, no big companies? What, what is it that we want to do with Agile? But I think that it's always important to ask, why is it that we want to do this? Why do we want to have Agile? And sometimes people can't answer. It's often that I come out and I ask people, why do you want to do Agile development? And they say, oh, well, it's somebody else who asked us to. And I go to that somebody else. And they say, oh, it's somebody else that asked us to. And I go to that somebody else. And finally, I meet somebody. They have no clue why they want to be Agile. They don't even know what it means. They just think it sounds good. And I just, I just try to make it as pleasant for the developers and the architects and the project managers as I possibly can. And I just call it Agile. So that's it for now. And I'll check my app to see if there are any questions. Thank you so far. <laughs>